So the, the original plan for the conference, um, I wasn't actually scheduled for a talk today, but then um, Father Ephraim wasn't able to become because of his illness, and so there was an empty spot, and Father Mary Benedict asked if I would um, fill it. So my um, the title of my talk is Mary, Queen of Our Hearts, and I feel very privileged to be able to speak of Our Lady today to all of you, and especially under the title of Mary, Queen of, all of Our Hearts. But first of all, I want to ask you a um, couple questions, and you don't have to answer, just answer in your heart. But do you, do you automatically think of Our Blessed Mother as Queen? I mean, when you think of Our Lady, do you think of her as Queen? And then secondly, is she truly Queen of your heart? You know, the society that we live in absolutely abhors the whole idea of a monarchy. It's just, it's abhorrent to us. We've got all, you know, we're all free and, and we have this team spirit anymore. I remember, I don't know what, maybe it was in the 70s or the 80s, all of a sudden you didn't have any um, long tables that someone sat at the head. You always had to have these round tables so that nobody felt like anybody was head, you know, all this teamwork things. And it actually started a long time before that. You know, the Age of Enlightenment, that's what they call it in history, really wasn't, I think, an enlightenment. But it had, as one of its goals, it had many goals, but one of them was to rid men of what they considered the terrible evils of monarchy. Freedom, equality was the cry, as one by one the Catholic monarchies of Europe toppled. And, but we all know that this conflict just didn't begin with the Enlightenment, that it actually started a long time ago with the rebellion of Lucifer and when he refused to submit to God, to the power of God. And this conflict will go on until the end of time. Christ is our king, and Pope Pius XII reminded us of this in his encyclical on the queenship he wrote in 1925, Quas Primus. And he said that the evils that we face, and he's, the evils that we face now are much worse, I think, than what we're, he was facing in 1925. But he said the evils that we see today are the result of a lack of submission to Christ as our king, a lack of submission to his reign. And he felt that the solution was to restore all things in Christ. And first of all, in the individual hearts of man, and our Blessed Mother has a very important role to play in this restoration. So as you know, my title of my talk is Mary, Queen of Our Hearts. And I don't think I need to convince any of you of this. Pope Pius XII in 1954, actually October 11th, 1954, wrote an encyclical on the queenship of our Blessed Mother. And it's filled with quotes of the saints and the past popes on the queenship of Our Lady and why she has a right to this title. I'm just going to be quoting one from this encyclical. Beautiful encyclical. If you've never read it, I'd, I'd say read it, and I'm sure the bookstore sells it. Um, As Christ is our Lord and King by a special title, because he redeemed us, so the Blessed Virgin at, is Our Lady and Queen because of the unique way in which she cooperated toward our redemption by giving of her own substance by offering him willingly for us, and, be des and by desiring, praying for, and bringing about our salvation in a singular manner. And we, those of us who are cradle Catholics, we've grown up with the whole concept of Mary being our queen. After Holy Mass every day, unless it's a high mass, we pray the Hail Holy Queen. We have the fifth glorious mystery of the rosary, the coronation of our Blessed Mother as Queen of Heaven and Earth, how many of you as a child, and even later on, I know I still do because um, I'm in the convent, but participate in a May crowning, crowning our Blessed Mother as our queen. In the convent, we all take turns every day during May and make a little crown for Our Lady and, and crown her, and we get to pick our special hymn that we love, that we get to sing that day with the sisters. But um, before I go on, I would like to see, and this could be a raise of hands, a show of hands, um, how many of you are familiar with the book, True Devotion? Wonderful. <laughs> and how many of you have made your total consecration? Okay, I can end my talk. <laughs> you all know what I'm going to be saying. No, um, 
devotion um, to Mary, Queen of All Hearts, is an integral part of total consecration. St. Louis de Montfort had a great devotion to Our Lady under that title, quoting from, from True Devotion, Mary is the queen of heaven and earth by grace, as Jesus is the king of them by nature and by conquest. Now, as the kingdom of Jesus Christ consists principally in the heart or the interior of man, according to the words, the kingdom of God is within you, in like manner, the kingdom of Our Lady is principally in the interior of man, that is to say, his soul, and is principally in souls that she is more glorified with her son than in all visible creatures, and so we can call her, as the saints do, Queen of All Hearts. So it is evident um, that St. Louis Marie de Montfort was quite passionate, quite a passionate advocate of the reign of Jesus and especially his triumphant reign in the last days of the church. And it was with a clear understanding of Christ's reign that Montfort preached, wrote, and labored to implant in souls the perfect devotion to Mary because he knew that was an integral part of Christ's reign. And interestingly enough, I read this recently in a book on true devotion. I thought I had read every book there is, but there's still books out there. But it was saying that we don't know for sure what the title of his book was, um, True Devotion, because, remember, it was hidden during the French Revolution. And when they found the manuscript, finally, almost 100 years later, the title page was gone. And so some of them, some people think that it might have been something to do with the preparation of the reign of Jesus Christ through the Most Holy Virgin Mary. And so we don't know, but we know that he definitely promoted this. He said that it was through the Most Holy Virgin Mary that Jesus came into the world, and it is also through her that he has to reign in the world. Now, you, many people read, raised your hands and said that you have read, you're familiar with the book True Devotion. But what I would like to suggest is that you take it up again and read it if you haven't read it for a while, because it's something that you can read often and still get something out of it. In our rule, the CMRI Sisters rule, we're obligated to read it at least um, in its entirety once a year. And we spend our Saturday spiritual reading always reading something on True Devotion to Our Lady. Quoting from Father Faber's preface in the beginning of True Devotion, which I think is very apropos, he says, I would warn the reader that one perusal will be very far from making him a master of it. So if you've just read True Devotion once, you say you can't say, well, I got it. I know what I'm supposed to do. No, we need to keep reading it. He says, Father Faber says, I may dare say so, if I may dare, 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 dare so, say so, <laughs> sorry, there is a growing feeling of something inspired and supernatural about it as we go on studying it. And with that, we cannot help experiencing, after repeated readings of it, that its novelty never seems to wear off, nor its fullness to be diminished, nor the fresh fragrance and sensible fire of its unction ever abate. And I, and I know that for a fact. I, I've read True Devotion for many, many years, and I'm always getting something new out of it. It's always touching my heart in a different way. There's always a different aspect of that total consecration. And I hope to show today in my talk something that I'd never really thought about until I was asked to prepare this talk is that the relationship between St. Louis Marie de Montfort's teaching and the message of Fatima. And I think by the end of the talk, you'll, you'll be convinced of it. Otherwise, I'll be an absolute failure, and I hope I won't be a failure. <laughs> no. So um, the message of Fatima and its importance. Well, number one, for any of the CMRI religious, it's the foundational spirit. It was why we were founded. It was why we began. For myself personally, it, had, it was an anchor of hope in the midst of a lot of chaos and confusion as I was growing up. Because I was growing up in the 60s, and I was growing up in the midst of all the changes in Vatican II. The nuns that taught me were taking their habits off, modifying them, and then basically, eventually, by the time I graduated, they weren't ha wearing habits anymore. The changes in the church plus society. You know, there was the Vietnam War going on at that time. We had the the assassination of President Kennedy, of Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., um, the Cuba crises. All these things were going on. The threat of communism, I remember seen as a little child, Khrushchev banging his shoe on the UN table saying he was going to bury America. And um, it was a confusing time. And the, the hardest part for me, I think, was the difference in how we were being taught in high school. 
what we were being taught and and the it wasn't Catholic but I didn't quite understand that because it was nuns and priests telling us it and you know we were always taught you don't question the priests but the message of Fatima through my very best friend in high school her mom was part of the Blue Army and I thank her Mrs. Ripple she's buried out in our sem- up in the cemetery cemetery at City Mary but she was one that insisted on us going to some of these Blue Army meetings and and um, it changed my life. It gave me hope. And the most important thing that it did for me, it gave me a way to make a difference. There wasn't a hopelessness. I knew that the message of Fatima made a difference in the world. And I don't know if you know much about the Blue Army, but the Blue Army was made to combat the Red Army, you know, and, and, and you know, the Blue Army was this militant Catholic group of, of people who were fighting with the rosary and the scapular and, and prayer and sacrifice and holy hours and we were going to overcome communism and we knew every single Hail Mary that we prayed was going towards making a difference and, and it changed my life and it's basically why I became a nun because CMRI was so Fatima orientated. You know, we're nearing the 100th anniversary of Fatima, just two more years, 2017 and I wanted to draw you back a little bit um, my poor students are here. <laughs> they always hear me saying how much I love history. But history is something that we learn from. And, you know, it, we can say it's his story because it all goes, it begins and ends with Christ, his coming, and, and then our acceptance of him. But it were ne- when Christ appeared to St. Margaret Mary, which I had never known until a few years ago, he, in his third apparition, he had asked St. Margaret Mary to make known to the king of France at that time, who was Louis the Fourteenth, the great sun king, the one that built Versailles. And this is a quote from our Lord. He said, The Eternal Father wishes to make use of the reigning monarch of France, Louis the Fourteenth, to proclaim public devotion of reparation to the Sacred Heart. He asked that the king erect a shrine in which a picture of his divine heart would be homage, receive homage. He also requested that the king ask the Pope, the Holy See, to authorize a mass in honor of the Sacred Heart. I don't know about you, but I never had learned that when I learned the messages of our Lord to St. Margaret Mary until a few years ago. In return, our Lord promised that the king would have his blessing and protection from all of his enemies. And unfortunately, the French court at that time was rife with scandal. Louis the Fourteenth was not living a very Catholic life, although he was supposedly a Catholic monarch, and he was not willing to respond to the requests of the Sacred Heart. Among some of the ladies of the court, this message did spread. So there was individual devotion to the Sacred Heart. Some ladies practiced it in the court, but it wasn't the king. It wasn't as God had asked it to be. So almost 100 years, okay, this is 1689, 1789, almost 100 years to the day after the message of the Sacred Heart had been ignored, the French Revolution began, the toppling of the Bastille, and then we know the horrors of the French Revolution. And you know, the French Revolution was just the beginning of revolution after revolution after revolution. And it's interesting, having taught that a couple years ago in modern history, we've spent a lot of time on the French Revolution. And as we were studying it, it was interesting to find how many things are similar in the situation in our country today as was in France before the Revolution. Economically, they were suffering. They had a huge national debt, astronomical national debt. I think we have one too. Socially, there was a lot of unrest lots of unrest and and people dissatisfied with things. There were just a lot of natural disasters, terrible um, droughts, terrible rains, terrible flooding. Interesting. Um, One of my favorite secular authors is Charles Dickens, and he wrote a book about this time uh, in history, and he actually got some of his information from people who had survived the French Revolution. So some of it was based definitely on fact. But I think his opening lines, and I love his opening lines of this book, The Tale of Two Cities, and I'm going to read them. And as I read them, just think about how it can apply to our times, I think. And it's a contrast of how the times are. 
It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. And most people know that, that first part. But the, it goes on. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. And I think, if you think about our times, I think a lot of that applies to us. I mean, there's a lot of um, progress. The social media is just bursting. There's so much progress, and yet so much um, degradation. So I think we can see the contrast here. France did not respond to the request made to St. Margaret Mary until 200 years later, almost 200 years, not quite, um, and just a shy a few years, but France was on the verge of being conquered in 1871 in the Franco-Prussian War. The laity in Paris had petitioned the Archbishop of Paris to fulfill the request, and they offered to raise funds to build the requested chapel on the hill of Montmartre, and that's the Sacre Coeur Basilica today. And it's interesting because almost the bishop gave, the archbishop gave permission, and almost immediately after this, they made a national vow. Our Lady appeared in Pont Maine, France, on January 17th, 1871. And it was just a short distance from where the German armies had advanced, and they were almost overrunning completely France. Now, Our Lady appeared to some children, and other people saw her, didn't see her, only the children saw her, but she, she appeared above a barn. In her hands was a blood-red crucifix, and a banner appeared at her feet with the words, Continue to pray. My son allows himself to be touched. Now, at that same moment, Our Lady in Paris revealed her immaculate heart in the Church of Our Lady of Victories in Paris, Paris to the parish priest there, and... On that same evening, the Prussian troops who were in the site of Laval, which was very close to Pont Maine, stopped at half past five, just about the time that the apparition took place. And it was they were very few miles off. And General Schmidt was reported to have said on the morning, because they turned around, and they just stopped. They didn't go any further. They could have advanced, and they could have taken over. But on the morning of the 18th, he said, we cannot go farther. Yonder in the direction of Brittany, there is an invisible Madonna barring the way. So the sud sudden stopping of the Prussian forces in the sight of Laval and their retirement following the next morning meant together with the saving of Brittany, the turning back of the tide of conquering soldiery from that part of France. And the war was practically at an end. None of those, um, well, on January 23rd, which is just a few, like a week later, 1871, the long hope for armistice was signed. Soon all the 38 conscripted men and boys returned to their home in Pont Maine unscathed. So what a beautiful thing that the, the, the um, prayers of these people actually turned the tide. Now, in our time, God has sent us another solution, seemingly the last solution, and this time through his mother. Remember, he sent his son to ask. Then he sent his mother. And it began even before the apparition at Pont Maine. In fact, it began in the Garden of Eden when God said to the devil, I will put enmities between thee and the woman. And I don't know if you know the song that the high schoolers sang, the Ave Maristella. It talks about Eva's name reversing. Now, Eva is for Eve. And if you reverse Eva's name, we have Ave. And so Our Lady is the new Eve. She reversed the, the curse, and she is the one that's going to crush the serpent's head. Now, God sent his mother in a series of apparitions. The first one was in 1830 in Rudebach, on Rudebach in Paris, to St. Catherine Labre. She was just a young nun. She hadn't been in the convent very long. She had three apparitions of our Blessed Mother um, all together. I always thought the first one was kind of cute because she, was, she, wanted to, she wanted to see Our Lady. And um, I guess it was the, the vigil of the Feast of St. Vincent de Paul, who was the founder of their order. 
And they were all given a little piece of his surplus. And um, she, in her simplicity, tore it in half and swallowed half of it and asked her asked if she could see our blessed mother <laughs> and that very night she saw our lady <laughs> so it's kind of it, kind of cute don't go around swallowing things though because i don't think you necessarily see our lady but i think our lady was very pleased with her um her simplicity and her trust she actually got to kneel our lady was sitting in a chair she she was able to kneel at our lady's feet and rest her hands on our lady's knees can you imagine and she talked to our blessed mother for quite a while but Our Lady at this apparition, the second one on November 27th, she gave us the Miraculous Medal. And I don't know how many of you wear the Miraculous Medal, but if you don't wear it, I would consider trying to find a Miraculous Medal and wear it because Our Lady promised great graces for those who wear the Miraculous Medal. And if you notice that the Miraculous Medal on the back has an M in the cross, which is totally true devotion to Jesus through Mary, and it has the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart on it, and in the apparition, Our Lady had worn many rings, and some of them had, had light shining from them, and some of them didn't. And Catherine asked why some of them weren't shining. And Our Lady said it's for those graces for, that people don't ask for. They forget to ask for. And so don't, don't forget to ask for graces from our Blessed Mother. She's more, more than willing to give them. Shortly after that, just 16 years later, our Lady appeared at La Salette, way up in the mountains, the French Alps. I had the privilege of being able to go there. Beautiful shrine there. Very sad. When she appeared, she was crying. And she appeared to two children, Maxim and Melanie. And just a few of her words to them. She was crying because she was trying to wake up mankind to stop offending. She says, if my people do not wish to submit themselves, obviously, to God. I am forced to let go the hand of my son. It is so heavy and weighs me down so much, I can no longer keep hold of it. Our Lady was holding back the chastisement. She, has a, she said, I have suffered all of the time for the rest of you. If you do not wish my son to abandon you, I must take it upon myself to pray for this continually. And the rest of you think little of this. In vain you will pray, in vain you will act. You will never be able to make up for the troubles I have taken for the rest of you. So a mother's heart pleading. And Our Lady at La Salette was wearing a crown, so she was showing her queenship, but she was also showing her motherly concern for all of us. Our Lady, Our Lady complained of two particular sins that were taking place rampantly in France, and not just France. One of them was working on Sunday and how much that goes on today. It used to be that many, many, many stores were closed on Sunday in respect for that. I know when I was working, it was not very common that stores were open. Now it's just, you can't even tell the difference between a Saturday or Sunday or a weekday. So two things. The one was working on Sunday. The other one was taking the name of our Lord in vain. These were the two sins that she said were weighing her arm down, that she could barely lift it to keep our Lord from punishing us. And those two things have not changed. I think they've gotten worse. In 19, I'm sorry, in 1858, Our Lady appeared at Lourdes. And I think this is one of the apparitions that most people are familiar with, St. Bernadette. It, number one was a confirmation of Pope Pius IX's Declaration of the Immaculate Conception. He had made it a dogma of our faith in 1854. And, you know, I don't know if you know much about the life of Pius IX, but he was literally a prisoner in the Vatican, surrounded by lots and lots of enemies. It was at the time that they were starting to push evolution, starting to push there was no original sin. You know, all those things were starting to come out way back then. And he didn't really have a way to combat it except through kind of a secretive way. And he, de he declared the Immaculate Conception as trying to combat these errors. And if you think about it, defining the Immaculate Conception, if there was an Immaculate Conception, there had to have been a reason for it. And the reason was original sin. And if there was a r original sin, there had to be an Adam and Eve. And if there was an Adam and Eve, the whole idea of, of evolution was not, not true. 
And so it was his way of combating the, the errors of that day. I don't know how much we remember of the message of Our Lady of Lourdes, but Our Lady asked for penance, penitence, penitence, penitence. She asked Bernadette to kiss the ground for poor sinners. She told Bernadette, and through Bernadette, all of us, I do not promise to make you happy in this life, but only in the next, trying to show that we're not supposed to make this our happiness. Yes, we can be happy, but we can't rest on this alone. This isn't our, our dwelling place. We're meant for something higher. She also promoted the Holy Rosary. Our Lady appeared to St. Bernadette 18 times. Fifteen of them, these apparitions, mirrored the 15 mysteries of the Rosary. In 1871, as we spoke of earlier, Our Lady appeared at Pont Maine. Her message was, But pray, my children, God will hear you in time. My son allows himself to be touched. Again, the message of prayer. In 1917, Our Lady appeared at Fatima. She has five points to her message. Very easy points to remember. Prayer, especially the Holy Rosary. I think she asked for it at every apparition, the six apparitions. Penance. Remember the angel of Portugal told the children to make everything you do a sacrifice. Penance, again. Reparation. Making up. You know, it's not enough just to do penance. We have to repair. They're two different concepts. And this is when the devotion of the Five First Saturdays had been instituted. And it's interesting because in, at the convent, we're reading one of these real thick, huge books on the whole truth of Fatima. And I didn't realize that, you know, the devotion of the Saturdays was already in place. And the actually devotion of 15 First Saturdays was in place. But our Lord, when, our, when Luc- Lucia asked our Lord why, you know, why uh, the difference, and he was saying that he would rather have people make five fervent ones and do it well than try to do the 15 and not do it well. So again, if you haven't made your first Saturdays, your five first Saturdays, that would be something to put on your list to do. Very important. Our Lady promises that she will be with you at the moment of your death. What a promise. And, you know, it has been commuted to a Sunday. If you can't, you know, like if you're in a parish where there isn't a Saturday Mass, for Saturday Mass, the priest can commute that to a Sunday. You can fulfill those obligations. It seems like almost that God knew that in the future, of course he knew, because he's God, but that there would be a need to commute that. And so it's been, it's been commuted. Another part of the five points, modesty. Certain fashions would be introduced that would gravely offend my son. More souls go to hell because of the sins of the flesh than any other sin. And then consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Our Lady first revealed her heart on, in the June apparition where she told them that she would be the path that would lead them to God. But in the third apparition in July, when she showed them hell, the vision of hell, after that was over, she said, you have seen hell where the souls of many poor sinners go. In order to save these so- sinners, God wishes that devotion to my Immaculate Heart be established throughout the world. Think of that. God Almighty wishes that devotion to the Immaculate Heart may be established. That should be something that we like, whoa, that's serious. God wants this. You know, it's not a saint. You know, not that the saints aren't important, but when God Almighty wants this, we need to wake up and pay attention. We are nearing the 100th anniversary of the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima. And as we look around the world around us, what do we see? Do we see that the message of Fatima has been taken to heart? I remember the first year I was able to visit Fatima was in 1976, and we were able to actually have a mass in the little Capolina before they built that huge monstrosity. But I met... We were staying at a Dominican house, and there were some Dominican sisters there, not in the, you know, they were in the modern habit. But two of them had actually seen the miracle of the sun. And I was like, oh, this is amazing, you know. So I asked them. One of them went as a believer, and one of them said she was 19 years old, and she went to make fun of it because she didn't believe. She just thought, this is going to be ridiculous. There's not going to be any miracle, and I'm just going to be here to make fun of everybody. And she was converted. They both entered the convent. But what was sad 
because they were it was like a boarding house and they had a lot of girls there and the girls there I don't know if you remember the ones that were on that pilgrimage but the girls there were in mini skirts they weren't modest at all and I asked these sisters I said do you think that the message of Fatima has been lived as Our Lady wants it oh yes 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 it's been it's lived I thought, oh how sad <laughs> you know right there in Fatima but we see that as not being lived but then we have to look into our own selves. Have I taken that message to heart? Do I live the message of Fatima? Do I cut corners in certain areas? Do I pray my rosary? Do I try to dress modestly? Have I consecrated myself to the Immaculate Heart of Mary? Has the world been consecrated to the Immaculate Heart? Have I consecrated myself to the Immaculate Heart? In 1942, in the midst of World War II, Pope Pius XII prayed this prayer publicly. To thee, to thy immaculate heart, in this tragic hour of our history, we consign, we entrust, we consecrate, Holy Church, the mystical body of thy Son, Jesus, which is suffering and bleeding in so many places and afflicted in so many ways. And not only the Church, but all the world, rent asunder by deadly discord, aflame with the fires of hate, victims of its own iniquities. It was his way of trying to consecrate the, immac- the world to the immac- heart of Mary. And again in 1948, he said, It is our will that wherever the opportunity presents itself, this consecration be made in various dioceses as well as in each parish and each family. And then he went on to ask this question, What Christian heart, no matter how lukewarm and thoughtless, could resist the voice of Mary? Truly, how could we? Our mother is calling. I remember reading a meditation um, a couple months ago, and the the title of the meditation was "Your Mother Is Calling," and I and and we need to think about that. And I think there was a pamphlet we used to sell years ago um, that was called "Children, Your Mother Is Calling," and it was a little bit little pamphlet for children about the message of Fatima and how they could live it. And I found this was very interesting. In 1946, it's an apparition that's not very well known. If you ever get a chance to get the book by the Queen's Command, it is in there. It was locally approved, never with the same approval as Fatima. But in 1946, Our Lady appeared at Marian Free, Germany. This is two years, or what, um, four years after Pope Pius XII's consecration. And Our Lady said many things, and I'm only quoting a few, It is true that the world was consecrated to my immaculate heart, but this consecration has become a fearful responsibility for many men. I demand that the world live this consecration. She went on to say that that Satan had power over all who are not consecrated to her immaculate heart. The message is amazing. It's, it's, It's frightful in many ways. But it ends with a very consoling. It says, Have unreserved confidence in my immaculate heart. Believe that I am able to do everything with my son. Substitute my immaculate heart in place of your sinful heart. Then it will be I who will draw the power of God and the love of the Father will renew the fullness of Christ in you. Fulfill my request so that Christ may reign as the King of Peace. So again, she wanted to be known as Mediatrix of All Graces. And there was two apparitions, one in May and one in June. When again, I said it wasn't. It wasn't. It was only locally approved. I had the privilege of um, being able to visit that shrine twice, and very inspired by being able to go there. So we know. I don't think it's a surprise to any of us. And I think, unless we're living with blinders on, we know that we're living in a time of great crises, and if not the greatest crises that the church has ever seen, and a worldwide crisis as well. Yet. We are not left to ourselves. We have been given a remedy from the Mother of God. We just need to ask, has it been heeded? And not just point the finger at other people. Well, they're not heeding it. That's the reason why none of this is getting better is because these people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. No, we shouldn't point the finger at anybody but ourselves. There's that old saying that you tell children when they're pointing the finger at somebody, you know, when you point the finger at somebody, there's three fingers pointing back at you. So... You shouldn't point the finger at anybody because you're getting <laughs> more. But we can't point the finger at anybody else except ourselves. We're the ones that can make a difference. And we can make a difference with others as well. If 
Mrs. Ripple hadn't made a difference in my life by introducing me to Blue Army. I don't know where, I, where I'd be right now. And there's so many people. There's one person, Father Casmer's mother, who used to call me once a month as a teenager. And I used to dread her calls because I knew what she was going to ask. I'm like, oh. But she, would, she never gave up on me, you know, and I was just a bratty teenager, you know, wanting to you know, live my life <laughs> without somebody in my face telling me I needed to do something holy. But she would call every, every month and ask me to make a holy hour on the 13th of the month. And I never had the courage to say no. <laughs> so I was always making these holy hours. And the thing is, you couldn't say no to her because she just wasn't the type of person you could say no to. But she, then she'd say, well, why don't you get some of your friends to do it too? And I'd like, <laughs> you know. And I remember in, in high school asking a couple of my friends, hey, um, I like to make a holy hour, <laughs> you know? And they were like, sure, what is that, you know? And so it, you know, it, she helped me actually be a, a better influence on other people too. St. Lucy, not St., but Lucia, uh, the, the third seer of Fatima, she had an interview in 1957, and I'm just going to quote parts of it, but it's an interesting interview, and it's something I think we should take to heart. Um, so, Father... The Most Holy Virgin is very sad because no one has paid any attention to her message, neither the good nor the bad. The good continue on their way, but without giving any importance to her message. The bad, not seeing the punishment of God actually falling upon them, continue their life of sin without even caring about the message. But believe me, Father, God will chastise the world, and this will be in a terrible manner. The punishment from heaven is imminent. The devil is in the mood of, for engaging in a decisive battle against the Blessed Virgin, and the devil knows what it is that most offends God, and which in a short space of time will gain for him the greatest number of souls. Thus the devil does everything to overcome souls consecrated to God, because in this way the devil will succeed in leaving the souls of the faithful abandoned by their leaders, thereby the more easily will he seize them. And this is where I think we need to Take hope, but he says, she says, God is giving two last remedies to the world. These are the Holy Rosary and devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. These are the two last remedies which signify that there will be no others. Now, going back to Our Lady at Marianfield, one of the things she said that God was not going to si- send any more signs and wonders. And she said that because people just focus too much on the sign and not the message. How true that is. And then regarding the Holy Rosary, it's a beautiful quote. Regarding the Holy Rosary, Sister Lucia said, Look, Father, the Most Holy Virgin in these last times is in which we live has given a new efficacy to the recitation of the Rosary to such an extent that there is no problem, no matter how difficult it is, whether temporal or above all spiritual, in the personal life of each one of us, of our families, of the families of the world, or of the religious communities, or even of the life of peoples and nations that cannot be solved by the rosary. There is no problem, I tell you, no matter how difficult it is, that we cannot resolve by the prayer of the rosary. With the Holy Rosary, we will save ourselves. We will sanctify ourselves. We will console our Lord and obtain the salvation of many souls. What a consolation that is. We all know how to pray the rosary. We all have rosaries. What a consolation. But do we go to the recitation of the rosary when we have a difficulty, whether it's a personal difficulty, um, a family difficulty, whatever? Do we go to the rosary when we're having problems in our government? All that. It's, it, there's no problem whatsoever. Our Lady promised that can't be solved by the rosary. We saw that, you know, years ago, many years ago, in Brazil, when the communists were ready to take over, I think it was in 1960, and the women and the children, and probably some men, I'm not sure, (laughs) but I always remember reading about the women and the children, but I'm sure men were there too, um, went out in the streets streets and prayed the rosary, and the communists up and left, just with no reason, just up and left. There was a reason. We know the reason. The reason was the rosary. When I went to Austria the first time, that first pilgrimage in 1976, we stayed in a hotel, and the, the manager of the hotel came up to another sister and I and said, thank you 
the what? <laughs> Didn't do anything. <laughs> um, he was thanking us because we were nuns. And he also said that Catholics had saved Austria because the Catholics had gone out in mass and prayed the rosary. And he wanted to thank us for that because he wasn't Catholic. So Mary's last effort to save her children, she begs us. When children are in imminent danger and they don't seem to understand that they're in danger, what do you mothers all do? You rush to the side of your children to help them. And this is what our blessed mother is doing. Mary has come down to earth not just once, not just twice, many times. She has shown us the horrors of hell. She begs us to think of her heart, that maternal heart that bore her, bore us, and that loves us as no mother could ever love us. They say, if you combine all the love of all the mothers that ever lived in the whole world, that couldn't even come near the love that Our Lady has for us. She asked Lucia at one point, when she showed her heart, surrounded with thorns, you, my daughter, at least console me. What child of God will refuse to listen to this blessed mother and to the request of her heart? What sinner will turn away, knowing that she's the mother of mercy. It is a mother's request. It cannot. It must not be refused. So many Fatima devotees, I've seen this in the past and just wonder why, and I think it's the devil trying to get us distracted, but so many Fatima devotees get focused on the consecration of Russia. It has to be done, the consecration of Russia. Yes, Our Lady asked for that to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But personally, I think, you know what, getting all focused on that is a detour in a sense because it gets us off track. We just have to worry about our personal consecration to our Blessed Mother. How am I living that? Then the rest will come. But we can't, you know, I think the devil gets us all sidetracked. Only if this was done, things would be better. No, if we were better, things would get better. So what is consecration? St. Louis de Montfort talks about it consists in giving oneself entirely, as a, t- entirely and as a slave to Mary and to Jesus through Mary, and after that, to do all that we do through Mary, with Mary, in Mary, and for Mary. I think you've seen the little twif, T-W-I-F. That's through, with, in, and for Mary. Um, we've made that our, like our, um, like motto or, I don't know, for the, for the years, the sisters, we, you know, we try to be twiffing all the time. <laughs> um, know that there's two things in the devotion. First, an act of total consecration to Jesus through Mary. And then the second thing is a state of being consecrated. It, this consists in a permanent disposition of living and acting habitually in dependence of Mary. It's not a thing that you pray once. Oh, yeah, I made my consecration to Mary. I made it on March 25th, 1999. No, it's a constant. It has to be permanent, and it has to be habitual. It embraces our whole life and can appear small and trifling, but it's like the mustard seed in the gospel. I think it is on this second part that we need to seriously reflect and look within ourselves as individuals to see if our total consecration is our permanent disposition. Do I ever step outside of that? That has embraced my whole life. And I'm sure you'll agree with me. I, I know I have work, areas to work on that we all could improve in this area. St. Louis Marie de Montfort never tired of repeating that he sought with all his might to establish a solid devotion to Marian souls only in order to, sol- order to establish a more perfect devotion to our Lord. That was the driving force of his apostolate, the formation of true disciples of Jesus Christ. So it's not enough for us to practice it ourselves. That's the first step. But we also, and this is important because St. Louis de Montfort was on fire. If you've never read his... Um, I don't know what it's called, this letter to the missionaries. Unbelievable. He's going, fire, fire. (laughs) The house of God is on fire, and he's just on fire with zeal. He wants to spread this, and this is how we should be. Once we've got that fire within ourselves, you know, I was joking with someone, I was joking with the sisters a while ago, that we should have global warming, but global warming in the sense that the flame of our love of God expands so much that we set the world on fire. That would be the global warming that we need because we want to set it on fire with the love of God. So we don't, we don't want to just keep it to ourselves. Like our Lord said, you don't light a lamp, put it under a bushel, you let it shine. So we want to also make it known widely. We need to be apostolic. Our Lady needs us to be her little messengers, her little army. We don't have the blue army anymore, but we have to, we're the part of the church militant. We need to be doing something. 
We can't just afford to be downcast witnesses of events sitting there going, oh, things are so bad. Oh, my goodness, did you know what they did today? Oh, do you know what's going on in the Vatican? Oh, my goodness, look what's going on in society. Oh, how horrible. That's not the solution. We need to do something about it. What are you doing to spread the message of Fatima? Have you spread the message of Fatima? Do you talk about the message of Fatima with your coworkers? Have you ever talked about it to anybody? Do you have apostolic literature? As, as nuns, we're supposed to. And I just gave away some just the other day. Carry around with us some literature, rosary, scapulars, you know, something that explains the message of Fatima. Be an apostle. God needs us. He needs us to do this. Don't be a downcast witness of events. Just going, oh, lamenting. Oh, it's so bad, so bad. I can't believe how bad it is. Do something. Visit nursing homes. Pray the rosary in a nursing home. Have the block rosary. Um, there's all kinds of things we can do. We just can't sit back and not do anything and feel bad the way it is. This is from True Devotion. The triumph of Christ the King in the church during these the last days of the world is logically... Well, it's not from True Devotion. It's about True Devotion, sorry. The triumph of Christ the King in the church during the, the last days of the world is logically related to the universal reign of Mary in men's hearts. That the rain may come, that thy rain may come, let the rain of Mary come. When will the happy time come when the divine Mary will be established mistress and queen of all hearts in order that she may subject them fully to the empire of her great and holy Jesus? When will that happy time come, that age of Mary come, when many souls chosen and procured from the Most High by Mary shall lose themselves in the abyss of her interior, shall become living copies of Mary to love and glorify Jesus? We need to be living copies of Mary. In our role as nuns, we have, we're, we're called to be the visible hands of Mary at work in the world today. So true devotion, it was a request that our, you know, our lady asked for consecration. God, and, and in true devotion, St. Louis says, God then wishes to reveal and make known Mary, the masterpiece of his hands in these latter, ta- latter times, which is now, God wishes that his holy mother should be at present more known, more loved, more honored than she has ever been. And then you correlate that, that's St. Louis de Montfort with, my son wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. It is evident that the consecration of Pius XII of the whole human race calls for the individual ratification on our part. How can we ratify it more perfectly than by making Mary the mistress and the queen of our hearts, as St. Louis urges? so that she may give us to her son, Jesus. And then I compared, um, I will compare, (laughs) Um, but the last thing is when Our Lady came at Fatima, um, it's interesting, the the comparison that I came up with. I'm going to read what St. Louis de Montfort talks about, the saints of the latter days, not the Mormons, obviously, um, but when he talks about the formation of the saints, think about if, if you're living this way. In a word, we know that they shall be true disciples of Jesus Christ, walking in the footsteps of his poverty, humility, contempt of the world, charity, teaching the narrow way of God. Not this, everybody saved in pure truth, according to the Holy Gospel, and not according to the maxim of the world. doesn't matter what the Supreme Court might say is okay. It's not okay. Troubling themselves about nothing, not accepting persons, sparing, fearing, and listening to no mortal, however influential he may be. They shall have in their mouths the two-edged sword of the word of God. They shall carry on their shoulders the bloody standard of the cross, the crucifix in their right hand and the rosary in their left, the sacred names of Jesus and Mary in their hearts, and the modesty and mortification of Jesus Christ in their behavior. This is way 200 years before Fatima. Before Fatima, before Our Lady came, one of her faithful clients holds out to us the very virtues that she was to ask for, the rosary, mortification, modesty, penance, and above all, the consecration to her immaculate heart. So, now it's up to us. It doesn't matter what happened. I don't know if you've ever read about the the Vendi. They lived at the time of the um, French Revolution. They were people who had been, um, St. Louis Marine Montfort had worked with them quite extensively. They stood firm. They're on their they had badges of the Sacred Heart. They stood firm against the revolution. They were, a lot of them were martyred. We don't know what future holds for us, but we do know one thing. We're on the winning side because Our Lady promised in the end 
my immaculate heart will triumph. Thank you.